people like should just do it, you know, just go for it. card rip tragic welcome back to episode six of the hags podcast and today we have two very special guests we have bailey mcconnell hello you've heard about her in previous episodes and my husband alex chouse You've also heard about him in previous episodes, and they are the writers of our feature film, Against Us. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you. What an introduction. <laughs> I know. I love that. So professional. So before we get into the interview portion with them, we're just going to do our usual thing, just with two more people than usual. Mm -hmm. How was y'all's week? What What's happened? It's a Monday, so yeah. how was your Monday? Mine is Dragon Man. I'm going on vacation next week. Oh, where are you going? To the beach, to the Gulf, where all the shark attacks are. Ooh. Alabama or Florida? Alabama. There's only one orange beach. <laughs> Be careful. I hope I live to see the premiere of this movie. Y you will. <laughs> My life's work. Yes, the shark will go away. For our audio listeners, Alex and I are sharing a microphone because we obviously live together and we have this microphone, one singular. So, yeah, they're expensive. So, we couldn't <laughs> get an additional mic. Sorry, Alex. That's good. I like hearing myself talk at the same time as I'm talking. <laughs> You're doing great, Alex. <laughs> just a slight echo it's fine oh my gosh that's horrible <laughs> one day we'll have upgrades oh we'll, we'll have a studio a booth a studio everybody gets their own chair coffee on draft literally <laughs> yes ma'am ice americano please yeah uh it was a rough monday mm -hmm. i feel like i've been a negative nancy the past couple episodes but it's been rough <laughs> You've been going through it. You're about to be, that's not even negative. It's just being honest about your situation. If you were that's negative, true. you probably wouldn't be here. That's true. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Oh, I did want to do a quick plug real quick. Uh, a short film I did is now available to publicly watch. It finished its festival run and I'll link it in the description and the show notes. I heard it's, it's great. so good. I literally told Bailey about it. It's so, so good. good. <laughs> Thank you. It's really uh, good. You all know, but the listeners probably don't know that uh, I get cast in certain roles, typically. Prostitutes, drug <laughs> addicts, assholes, <laughs> manipulators. I'm usually, I play the bad guy a lot, but this character is not the bad guy, and she's sweet, and she she evolves and it was a lot of fun yeah you, it was so good i was taking notes like you made certain beats and choices and i was like that is so smart i know that was a cheyenne thing i know that was not written um yeah it was really really good you and mallory had great chemistry and it was great so jay mallory cheyenne bodied it up and happy pride thank you mm -hmm. uh yeah, the whole crew was amazing. Uh, it was a group of Alabama film professionals. And when the industry slowed down, shut down, they decided to start making projects on their own. And I'm, I'm pretty, they're still going. It's just a little slower because they all work on professional, you know, bigger budget crews for their jobs. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a good group. It's great. Yeah. Who edited it? Jay. So the director, Jay Galloway, edited it. Incredible. Yeah, edited it is weird huh. saying that back to back. But he edited it very well. <laughs> I want to know what it is about Cheyenne that makes her look so villainous. Honestly, I think it's the eyebrows, perhaps. I don't you know. Carry, you carry a commanding energy, I think. That's You're not a commanding is. person, but you carry like a commanding energy. Yeah. yeah. I, you look very assertive. And yeah, you definitely have a, when you walk into the space, it's yours. It's the Aries. 
Mm-hmm. I was going to say that. Oh, yeah. But I was going to take my time to get there. <laughs> I also think I can, not to sound like, uh, I don't know. I got to stop prefacing compliments to myself. I always Just say do. it. I think I've had, for my age, a lot of life experiences, and I know how to go in certain places that some people can't go or are scared to go or are intimidated by. And I just really like to dive deep in there and live the full life. And even if you were intimidated or scared or had any angst, like it would just propel you faster. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't slow you down. Yeah. So very good. Yeah. That makes for like a complex performance. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. And you can tell in the, in the, um, in the film it's really good i actually had to not to keep talking about cheyenne but i just gotta say one thing the uh the film uh, i just forgot the name of it it was shot in your hometown the heroin still kills kills. i had to turn that off because it you it was portrayed so well um and i feel like i haven't seen i mean i've seen a lot of your work but it was just really nice to see something so different from you so yeah it was nice for me too because i I didn't i bet it was a breath of fresh air yeah, she was sweet, and I didn't have to go to, you know, really dark, dark places. But yeah, 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 it was great. Good for the real. Hey, you know what? That's anything to diversify that real. <laughs> okay. Any anything you all want to update us on? Any? Yeah, M- me and Emily went to the beach yesterday. Okay. She said, "I have sunscreen." SPF eight. That eight. is not sunscreen. I didn't I get burned. <laughs> I'm so burnt. And if anybody needs a plug, it's Banana Boat. <laughs> I'm very burnt and in pain. And last night I was sticking to my sheets and rolling around. And I turned the AC on. I kept having to wet myself down. I don't know if you heard me making commotion all night, but I was like damn yeah we'll get you a higher spf next time yeah eight is nothing you need 30 (laughs) plus 30 yes you don't want skin cancer i am a darker person and i'm not dark but like i have i'm mexican and i wear yeah next time it will be 30 plus uh but yeah i've never had sunburn but it doesn't sound fun wait you've (laughs) never been sunburnt Never because in your whole life. I wear sunscreen and I reapply. Oh, and also I wear sunscreen yeah. on my face every day. Yeah, I think it's also harder for like you have an olive skin, like you have a darker skin tone. I think it's harder for you to tan or get burnt, isn't it? Yeah, it's harder for me to burn than a fully white person. Yeah. Yeah. I'm burnt as well. The heat index this weekend was tragically bad everywhere. And I was somewhere where they they just flat out said, we have no sunscreen. So I just put on the Korean facial sunscreen that's not waterproofed and waterproof and jumped right in the pool. Yeah. I wasted your money. Wasted my money. My N is free. That's what I used. <laughs> put it everywhere. I put it everywhere. Still, I'm a crisp. Yeah, you probably burn really easily. The blonde hair, the light eyes. Actually, I am warm toned. I'm red right now and I've been pale because I'm a hermit, but I actually do tan pretty, pretty easily normally, but not, I don't know how you've never had a sunburn. Like that's crazy to me. That's an, that's an insane amount of responsibility that I just don't possess. Mm Got to watch out for that skin cancer. Yeah. It'll catch up with me one day. You know, I watch your podcast while I'm cleaning my kitchen, usually. I have it playing in the background. Oh Sometimes God. at work, too, I'll put it on my headphones when I'm an audio listener. You're gonna hear I love it. It's like I'm hanging out. Yeah, yeah. It's like I'm hanging out. It's like I'm in the room with you guys. I love that. I, whenever I do anything, I have a podcast on, too. So it's cool that people are doing that with ours. I know. Continue it, everybody. And then maybe like and subscribe. <laughs> Yeah, I comment under. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You and Rebecca, number one fans. Shout out Rebecca. Uh, and 
And your mom. We cannot forget her. And my mom. And Tony. Yes, Tony. Oh my gosh. Yes, huge shout out. Hold, please. <laughs> do, 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 do. Mm. I'm going to look really short now. Well, no, this is actually oh. more. Actually, it's pretty proportional. I'm just going to do this. Okay. Oh <laughs> okay. Well, if that's it, we can jump into our interview. Oh, man. So the first thing I want to ask, Bailey, you saw the short film we made for the film race, and you heard about our ideas for the film, and you just went right for it and went in and were so creative. Where did that come from? Did you always want to write film? Did you tell us? Yeah, so... I mean, I've always been someone who writes in their free time. So, you know, my really cringy poetry that I wrote through like my angsty years. And um, I love, I've always loved like making up stories, writing stories. But Jimmy really just gave me the the story idea. And I was just pitching her ideas. And it kind of started as a joke where she was like, you know, we should give you a writing. We're going to have to give you a writing credit. And I was just like, ha 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 who's your writer and she was like we don't know yet we're, we're still discussing that and I, I don't know I just kind of like saw the opportunity and it 50 50 fell in my lap and then I was just like hey here's an entire synopsis of like the story beginning to end what do you think about this type of idea and then I think you guys really like I, I was just surprised that you guys were so open to just kind of letting me hop on, but also just like equally glad that I just got the opportunity, I guess, just because, I don't know, it just felt right. You know, something like the universe kind of let it happen. Yeah. You brought so much to the table and you were already putting in the work. I felt like I could immediately trust you and you proved me correct. No, literally. <laughs> yeah, because we didn't know each other yet. Yeah, not really. We'd met briefly like once yeah they made dinner once mm -hmm. and then alex actually wrote a short film for hag that was amazing called fodder amazing. yes and we had a lot on our plate so we were going to have someone else direct it and it fell through and i felt horrible because the script is so good i don't want to speak for him fully but alex knows horror film more than anyone i know and knows so much history and it just felt like the perfect match as the producers. I don't know about you, uh, Jimmy and Emily, but that's how I saw it. And agree. we asked him to come on board. What were what your what were your thoughts coming into it? Yeah, I guess coming into it, I just had to read what Bailey had already put out there and then kind of try and understand the way that she was writing things. And I wanted to try and replicate as close as possible to her style of writing while kind of injecting really my love for horror into it. And I had to kind of chill out with the gore and stuff that I usually like to put in things. So it was a bit of an adjustment, but I think we got a good blend between the two of us and our writing in the end. Yeah, I completely agree. I feel like that's what makes the story so well-rounded is through both of your brains creating against us. Yeah. Alex is just fantastic to bounce ideas off of. And um, I just kind of felt like where I would hit a brick wall with, you know, taking these like larger concept ideas of where we wanted the story to go and kind of breaking it down with Alex, like how we're going to get there. I think Alex did a great job of kind of helping me kind of create those puzzle pieces throughout the story and kind of weaving them together from outside the writer's perspective it was really cool to we would come into our writer's room meetings we would all meet once a week for a long time like eight months yeah and like a year now. yeah we would come into it with reading what they had and asking them questions and we would find plot holes or like pieces that weren't fully connected and they just were so creative and coming up with how to connect everything and make it a through line throughout, which was really cool to watch. 
and finding ways to piece the story together like with the like the religious elements or like the the sisterhood elements or like the cultural elements from you know bulk in history like it was really interesting to see all of your final touches on the the script yeah, yeah. I remember one time Alex we had a meeting and we like we need more background on this like can we get some, a little research? And Alex came back with a long ass document. <laughs> he did the research. Did, you did. It was so good for me to read through that and really kind of like get more inspiration and kind of try to, because it's almost like Alex and I were writing like a prequel to a movie that hadn't finished yet, trying to create our antagonist to make our antagonist as complex as possible. And I think re Alex really brought a lot to the table with that. Yeah, that was that was one of the more fun parts for me because I like I don't know I just went back into weird ancient texts and read up stuff about Nephilim and just weird. Um, well, even H.P. Lovecraft I like a lot, so I read H.P. Lovecraft, and I started adding some like cosmic horror aspects just to the. It's not the forefront of the script but I kind of wanted to just keep it like an underlying aspect of the horror being something that can't be understood. So you don't want to show it fully or fully explain it and just kind of leaving a little bit uh, open-ended for the viewer to then uh, kind of chew on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's what makes it so good. Who would you say, and it could be writing slash films, but like, what is your like what is a, a writing style or a film that you has really inspired you like within your writing journey as well as stepping into the filmmaking space i'm very curious not fully writing style because just like idea wise i like the ideas of things hp lovecraft has put out uh but i mean they're not the most fascinating stories, but he's very unique. So I like to take uh, a lot of things that he wrote and just kind of not base anything off of it, but just kind of take the weird cosmic aspect of just like just ancient beings and uh, just layers of reality that we don't understand that are horrific and even kind of take, he kind of goes into like body horror a lot, which I like because it's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I love Cthulhu. Yes. For me, I would say what I was really pulling from when writing this was I wanted to think of someone that writes women really well. And I think um, number one for me was Gillian Flynn, the writer of Gone Girl. And also she helped write the screenplay and she wrote the novel Gone Girl, which is a revenge story typically all of my favorite movies are revenge stories so i'm surprised this one didn't become a revenge story but you know it maybe is that's though it kind of is in a way yeah you know it creeps in it creeps in i'm just you know I, yeah I, I would like to do something a little more revenge focused i guess because I, I i feel like with this one i really wanted to just kind of dive into the idea of like you know, community of women, women who have multiple layers to them, women who are genuinely scary. And I think that Gone Girl is one of those movies that every relationship I've ever been in, I've shown my boyfriend that film. And at the end, they're just looking at me like, like you're scary because she's scary because the 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 main character is so scary and if i find any relation to her i must be terrifying so I, I think just a story that is just powerful in that way that you think about that character you know later on i also wanted to dive into southern gothic as an aesthetic a lot um because we're basing the or we're, we're setting the story in the appalachian mountains and then that's a whole culture in itself that, you know, goes back and has outer cultures that came into that area and um, that settled there and kind of created its own type of community. And, you know, just totally shy away from what you see a lot of the times in 
a lot of the time in Hollywood, which is really glitzy and glammy and um, high capitalism, where you have Southern Gothic, which is kind of turning away from that idea and leaning into, you know, homesteading and then also leaning into the pagan roots that are coming from those outer cultures settling in those areas. So I really love Ethel Kane. She's a musician um, that really leans into Southern Gothic and Flannery O'Connor, which is really like Virginia Woolf. So I had a lot of inspiration for how, what I was pulling from when I was writing the script that was just really focused on, you know, female voices in media. Cheyenne, actually, um, we were talking about the different writers and the perspectives that they brought to against us. And what you just said is exactly what Cheyenne said was her favorite reason why she had you on the script or we, we, you helped write the script. So. Yeah. yeah. All of that came through. All of it. <laughs> it comes through. Yeah. Yeah. Going off of writing women and everything and also just themes what's like the number one thing you want people to take away from this movie Ooh, that's a good question I think the one thing I want people to take away is you know I want them to watch it and see our characters especially our our heroine our main character our protagonist I want them to watch her and you know kind of like relate to her desperation and kind of watch the way that she makes her decisions. And, and I don't, I don't want the, I, the last thing I would want is for people to be watching and be like, don't go in that door, you know? Cause I, I hate that. Like, I think like truly good horror is where if you were that main character in that person's position, you would make similar choices as them. So that's, that's something that I really want people to take away is just um, kind of see our main characters, loneliness and need for community and just her the the you know the places she would go in order to find that and the things she would overlook and the choices she would make in order to find herself and the situations that she finds herself in I love that mm -hmm. I do too I love that yeah and we this is a very good sign because uh we brought up the same things about the writing and I'm playing the protagonist and I've been thinking about the character and that was one of the things that really stuck out to me as I'm you know starting to work on her so that's cool I'm glad it's coming through yeah it does because oftentimes like especially in the script like people would think like oh she's making a bad decision but I like how the script it shows how it's justified with her backstory everything she's been through like people can see and relate to that and it's not just your typical horror movie like oh she's gonna land herself in a bad situation it really shows like the depths of like humans and everything that's the the last conversation that we had about the script was really tying that together because we were both just trying to find ways to find ways to get her to be coerced to stay and not make it unrealistic because that's very hard to do when weird and chaotic things are going on to just be like, why, why don't they just leave? So it's just like it, the difficulty there is to try and keep the character there within reason and, and get people to not only relate, but at least try to understand instead of try to pick it apart. Cause you got to leave a little area open where mm -hmm. they're, where it is fiction, but at the same time, it's gotta be somewhat realistic. Like you can't just, have somebody going with the flow for no reason. So trying to find reason to keep somebody in a bad situation and then playing with that is, that's fun. Yeah. And that's something that Alex and I changed a lot, like from the first draft when it was, you know, originally we thought it was going to be a short film. So when I first came up with the story, the obstacles that the protagonist face faces is they were totally different from what we ended with um, with our full feature film script. So that's something Alex really helped me with um, creating those types of scenarios and the conversations and the information that's communicated to the main character that kind of, you know, lead her to stay and go against her better judgment as a skeptical person. Alex, did you have anything to add about what you want people to get out of the film? Other than what Bailey's already said, I think, 
I want people to not be confused as to why she went to where she went. I, I think the most important thing is to have the audience be able to relate in such a way that they can understand why somebody would put themselves in a bad situation. And I also want them to be able to know the point of no return where like, okay, now you're stuck. And then the reaction of the character through the things that you're doing to them in the story don't have to make sense anymore because they can't do anything about it and not to be sadistic, but that's, that's when you have the most fun with writing, writing stuff with horror, because it's like, no matter what I do, you're not getting away now. They took the bait. Mm -hmm. What would you say your best piece of writing advice is for like people out there that want to write, but are scared you know, have written, but don't feel like their stuff is adequate. Like, what would you tell those people um, as writers? The best piece of advice I ever received, um, it actually was from a book on acting that one of my actor friends was reading for his acting class. And this is forever ago. I think I was in high school when he, this information was shared with me. But any type of performance art, you have to pull from your own human experience in order for it to come across as human. And I think, you know, just, you know, I know like, a, a, of course not everything about Cheyenne's life, but I know a little bit about Cheyenne's life. And I, I've had a lot of conversations with Cheyenne and her being cast as the protagonist really helped me when developing that character, because I could kind of imagine Cheyenne's like mannerisms and, you know, just, Cheyenne's a little stoic in her personality just naturally. So I felt like that would come really naturally for her when playing that character. And Cheyenne's an excellent actress. So I don't think she's going to, she would have any trouble even if I cat, if it, the character was totally different from her actual personality. But I just felt like the best way that I could conceptualize a girl going through kind of, you know, a, a fictional story with kind of outlandish, outlandish topics um, like, um, like paganism and almost like the magical, you know, component to the story, just really honing in on just those already existing human characteristics and playing off of those and kind of creating a character around, around those people. So, and that's why I had the hardest time with the villain, because I don't know if I, I mean, I don't know anyone that's, you know, has, has like an actual, um, idea in their head to you know kind of take over the world and like be all powerful as like an immortal being or something like that so like that's just something that's just so far-fetched from humanity that I really struggle with that so I pulled from other works of fiction for that um and Alex of course helped me with that being a lover of horror just as I am pulling from your own human experience and you know true human stories of other people that piece of advice was really good when writing the main character's relationship dynamic. And I think I had the most fun writing, you know, kind of, kind of creating that relationship because creating a sense of duality in the characters and their dynamics. And that's something that Ari Aster does really well in all of his movies and his writing. I had the most fun writing the, the romantic relationship uh, between the main character and her fiance because just getting to kind of create, uh, I knew I wanted the relationships to not be the most healthy because, you know, most relationships aren't, you know, the picture of health and, uh, you know, what we see on Instagram or, you know, just out in media day to day. And I, I wanted the characters to not be villainous to each other, but also like, I wanted like passive aggression and, misunderstandings and you know good intentions but it's coming across as controlling it's coming across as manipulating but it's not with it's not just because like one of them is like abusive or anything like that it's just a complicated type of relationship because these are two complicated people and i had the most fun writing that because you know my favorite one of my favorite horror movies ever is midsummer by ari aster mm -hmm. and he says that that movie is about relationships and, and then hereditary and another amazing horror film i just think those are both just like masterpieces uh that movie's about family 
and the dynamics between like a really complicated kind of messed up family. And I just, it's like, and both of those movies have outlandish topics. Like one's about uh, Colton Sweden. And then the other is about, uh, you know, their, their older generation was married to Satan himself. So it's like, it's just insane type of topic for a movie. And then it just, everyone comes across so real and the situations they find themselves in are just because they're humans and they're just messy and they're trying to do their best. And that's something that I really wanted to kind of add into our story. And I had a lot of fun kind of abusing that, uh, that power between that couple. So Alex, same question for you. What would be your biggest piece of advice to give to up and coming writers, writers that are already writing any writer? I guess my writing process is based off of what I do day to day. I write software. So uh, you, you get your idea, you get your requirements, and then I break them down and start off with just my high level idea of what I would think would be cool. And then I break it down into the three acts that I'd like to just start out with. And then, uh, I kind of give them a theme and then I break down each act following that theme down into uh, smaller parts. And then once I have all the parts set up, they follow each other down to the final act. Then I, uh, kind of set up little pieces of symbolism that I want and I put them wherever I think they fit. And then throughout the design that I have set up, I connect them together. And then from there I go in and I add in whatever type of detail I want. And then the first pass of dialogue. And then uh, you, at that point, you just got to read your dialogue out loud and okay. see how it sounds. Because when you write things, it does not translate. So you got to hear somebody say it and be like, oh yeah, that looked cool, but it, it sounds horrible. So then you just go through and you do iterative passes. So you make everything make sense. You connect the acts, you follow the theme of each act, and then you make it make sense. And that doesn't happen in one pass. So be patient and follow the framework that you set for yourself. I would pay money for that analytical mind to be able to just like put my thoughts in a grid and then be able to like software engineers just blow my mind anyway. Yeah, no, that's, that's really um, interesting to hear your take as a more analytical mind onto the the writing process. Also people like should just do it, you know, just go for it. I mean, that just is sim- like very oversimplification, but there's a million Reddit forums that you can submit your writing to. There's a million different prompts online. I mean, just, just starting with what you have, and it will only go up from there, truly. And if you're doing it online, it's a pseudonym. So then you can make it as cringy oh. as possible and take your feedback and then run with it. There That's what go. I used to do. That's the Tumblr age, you know? I was a yeah, Tumblr you know teenager. Same. We know about those pseudonyms online. Also, I want to say I did not create the toxic couple in the story based off of Cheyenne and Alex's relationship <laughs> because they have a beautiful relationship. <laughs> anything i made the fiance based off my own experiences oh you know what's funny about that like yeah we know that you didn't but honeyheads film a song for imogene the couple like the main character played by chrissy ray's boyfriend in it their names are cheyenne and alex and they are a very toxic couple and those weren't the original names i think they forgot that his name was alex and they wanted to use cheyenne and it just it just happened Mm -hmm. So now the toxic couple in their film is literally Cheyenne and Alex. And they were like, that's no, it's, it's not about you at all. <laughs> we're setting the record straight now. You're essentially working for your wife and her company in this. It's, it's a collaboration. There's not really someone in charge, but we are the producers and the directors of the project. So how is that? And why do you think it works? Well, it works because I like writing and it was going to be my artistic output because I've been working one side of my brain for a while 
and I used to draw as my artistic output, but I haven't been doing that. So doing this has been a mutually good thing. And yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really see any difference between writing for anyone else or writing for you guys. Cause I don't know. I'm just writing. You tell me your feedback and I do it. I guess, I guess it, just don't take anything to heart. It's probably really the thing that makes it work the most because if you let your ego get in the way, then you're always going to get mad. So when you're doing anything artistic, you got to shoot your ego in the head yep. because you're not going to, you're not going to create anything because you're going to get negative feedback at the beginning. And if you let that get to you, you, you don't do anything ever again. So put a lot of effort into something. And if somebody says something negative about it, you got to get over it. Yeah. I like that you said that you couldn't tell a difference between like working with Cheyenne and working with, if you were, you know, writing for another production company, because I really feel like that shows like the, like, the level of professionalism and space that Cheyenne and all of us have given you guys. Um, yeah. So that makes me feel good that you, you said that. Well, I wanted to ask Bailey the same question because you and Jimmy have been friends, best friends for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So how was that? How was it going into that? Were you nervous? And yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, Jimmy has seen literally all sides of me every phase I've ever been through and you know me and Jimmy we've always worked well together I mean we did school together we had you know me and Jimmy we've never had like a fight that dragged out you know like I think that like any like conflict because of course you're gonna have conflict with everyone but any okay. conflict we ever had I felt like we always have had foundation of like respect and admiration for each other and I think that we trust each other's intentions all the time yeah no I wasn't nervous at all I was super excited because you know I feel like I can be my weirdest most outlandish outlandish self with Jimmy and you know I feel like I could pitch her any idea and you know and I don't I don't get like my ego checked by Jimmy if she's like reel it in <laughs> reel it in Bailey because like, I don't know. I just like trust Jimmy's opinion a lot. And I respect, I hold Jimmy's opinion in high regard and always have. So, yeah, no, I think it's just that foundation of respect just between everyone. And I have that with you, Cheyenne, Alex and Emily as well. I don't feel like super defensive, you know, like if, if you guys don't like something that was written or you want to change something, like I don't, I don't feel defensive really because I, I trust your opinions a lot and I respect your guys' opinions a lot. So I just listen. Cause if you can't take criticism, you really can't advance in anything. So nope. got to have humility to move forward. When you go into a project, like a feature film, that's going to take years of your life to make trusting the people you're with, loving the people you're with, all of the above are very, very important. You don't want to get stuck in a, sticky situation yeah because most people say air on the side of caution when collaborating with friends and i feel like yes definitely but i don't know it's the the foundation like what you two have said the respect the trust we all have that with one another and it's why we've been able to do that to create against us definitely couldn't work with just any of my friends absolutely not I think they say that you can't work with your friends a lot of the time because I think when we're super close with people, we might feel, be more inclined to be more comfortable to cross boundaries with people. And I think throughout me and Jimmy's like what, 15 year friendship, we've yeah. like, I think even as kids, like we, we were pretty okay with not, with having good boundaries with each other. And I think that like, I don't know, I think that's just like, I've just had like trust with Jimmy, like my whole life so and then you know I've gotten to know you Cheyenne Alex and Emily through like this past year pretty well you know talking once a week on zoom and like going spending hours in the writer's room and yeah I just feel like you guys create a fantastic environment for creatives 
which I think you guys might, you know, people might try to take advantage of that sometimes. And then that's when you run into the people that are really disrespectful and don't kind of mirror that respect and just kind of like run kind of wild with their own ideas and their own control over work rather than collaborating. That's where the humility comes in again. Definitely. What I am a person, when I sit down to work on something, I'm very routine and I like to have a certain diffuser going. I like to have music playing in the background. I have an ambiance that I create when I want to focus. What would be the two writers when you've like sat down to work on against us? What was the like ideal setup that you guys did that like put you into your creative flow to write this script? Well, for me, I need like lots of caffeine. Mm -hmm. I always had like dim lighting. I mean, as you can see, I like never turn the overhead light on like in a house, even at night. And when I was writing most of the script, I was living in a warehouse loft that had no windows <laughs> to the outside world. So it was pitch black in my apartment for like six months, you know, and I, I would do, I would like project my movies on the wall with my projector and I would, sometimes I would listen to music and Sometimes, oh, I created a playlist of old country songs and bluegrass music. And, um, you know, kind of, I would play that sometimes when I was writing and try to get into the headspace. Lots of caffeine. Try to crank out my six pages each sitting. Didn't happen every time, but we got there eventually. Alex, what about you? <laughs> I don't have a method. Um, sometimes I would sit outside. Sometimes I'd sit at the kitchen table. Sometimes I'd sit in the bed. <laughs> He's just so engineer. I know. As, as, as long as I could clear out some headspace to be able to work, I didn't really care where I was working. Uh, I guess that's a that's your that's what got you into your flow state. It was like it's all internal. Like mine is definitely a physical within my space, whereas yours is just more internal. I think that's interesting to get both of y'all's different perspectives he can also work on anything when there's anything going on around him which oh. i did not do no i could be watching a movie or a youtube video on my laptop right next to him and he's just do 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 like writing away i'm like i couldn't do that but i'm glad you can can because this is good for both of us <laughs> yeah. yeah i need controlled chaos going on around me like I've got the Woodwick candle burning and then I've got a playlist or a movie because yeah, I need exactly. distraction while working. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. I like to control my space. I did spend one all-nighter on the script because uh, I was not working for six months out of the year we were writing the script. So I had a lot of free time and I just totally messed up my circadian rhythm in my, you know, sunlightless apartment and... Um, I like stayed up until like 6 a.m. writing. And I think in that day, I think I cranked out like 15 pages of the script, which is like a huge bulk of it. And it was still coherent, which is good. Cause usually when you're working that late, it doesn't turn out that good, but that's why I was glad to have Alex, you know, another pair of eyes on it. <laughs> yeah. But Jimmy was like, you don't have to do that. And I'm like, I know. It's so hard once you're in the flow state of something creative, it's hard to not let it consume everything like even right. the primal needs of sleep and eating and drinking water you know because if you if you have the energy to do something get as much of it squeeze as much of it out as you, as you can because some days you don't so the days when you can make 15 pages uh that'll counteract the days when you have zero so yeah definitely yeah. Uh, running with it when you have the energy do it that was definitely in the mindset because I was just, I was just kind of like, what if I don't, what if I don't feel like writing again? What if I can't think of anything? Cause there were several days where I sat down and I tried to add more scenes into the story and I just like nothing. And then I would just go back and edit what I had already written. And sometimes that would kind of create like some ideas for me to keep writing. And then sometimes it didn't. So I was just, when I was having a lot of ideas I really wanted to crank them out. Yeah. So that's kind of what led to me, you know, torturing myself. I don't believe that an artist has to suffer for their art. I don't believe that, but 
And also the creative flow will come back if you're a creative person. Don't have that mindset of lack. That's what I've learned through this process. <laughs> Live in abundance. Everything comes back. It mm -hmm. just is cyclical. You know, you got to ride the wave and when it's there, take advantage. And when it's not, allow yourself to be. 100%. Yeah. That's why being, that's why creative careers are so hard, really. I mean, yeah, I don't know how you actors do it. You just got to manifest it right there in the moment. Pure insanity. I don't, it's, it's just, it's a mix of technique. You have to learn the technique when it's not there. And then, um, yeah, taking advantage of the flow state. And as an actor, not to derail into acting, but it's, I think innately, a lot of actors are more tuned into that side of themselves. And even if they are taught otherwise growing up or by society, when you do the training, you can flip the switch back on. Yep. Mm -hmm. You learn how to become an open vessel. I think Tony, I'm, we reference Tony all the time on this podcast, but it's so true. And he teaches that in Meisner is you just learn how to be open. Mm -hmm. It's a technique and it just takes time. And then, yeah, if you innately have the thing where you can feel deeply, then it's easier to get there, but it's just a skill. To quote myself from the thanks for coming set after we wrapped, I look mean, but I cry a lot. <laughs> you do that, look mean Diane. I, I would not want to cross you what are you most looking forward to seeing come to life from the film Ooh, any any of the like intricate outdoor scenes I think are gonna that's gonna be tricky to make those come to life and the practical effects I think I'm excited for those yeah Every time I think about the movie premiering though and sitting down and watching it with, you know, my loved ones, I literally tear up. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm, I'm excited for all of it, which is kind of a lame answer, but definitely the, the other things I said as well. <laughs> I got a pretty fun yeah. scene that I'm excited to see. Yeah. Between that and how any of the, dream sequences are shot are both very interesting for me i love yeah. dream sequences i do too my question kind of piggybacked off that the bulk of your work is done it's not complete and you're not going anywhere but the bulk of it's done and now you kind of just get to watch a lot of the process happen so not necessarily the script coming to life, but which part of that process are you most excited for? Because there's so much, <laughs> like from the campaign, the investors, the pre-production, production, et cetera. For me, I'm very excited to see who is cast in the other parts. I'm so excited for that. Because I, you know, I have these characters in my head when writing them. And I just, I'm interested to see how, you know, how an actor reads the script and brings it to life even more, you know, and I, I really, and the costumes, because I'm obsessed with the aesthetic that we create with the setting and the costumes. So. Yeah. When it comes to the rest of the process, I think I'm mostly excited to see how the final edit gets pieced together because I would imagine I'm coming down with you for some of it. If you can. Yeah, well, I'll be able to work from Huntsville, so. Oh, that's true. Um, yeah, so I'll be able to see some of it get shot, so I'm interested to see how those shots, you know, standing on the outside look like once they're fully edited. So that raw footage to final edit, I think will be cool to see. They say there's three versions of a story. There's the writers, the directors, and then the editors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very true. It's crazy too. You're on a location and you see it obviously with your eyes, but then when you go and watch the edit, how different it looks. It's incredible. It's amazing how yeah. cinematic things become. And it's just, it's art. It's art. Definitely. I completely agree. Yeah. It makes me emotional thinking about all the steps too. So Bailey, that's valid too. <laughs> I will be hysterically crying when it's on the screen. Oh yeah, big time. I teared up. I think it was last episode about 
when we wrap or maybe it was the one before i don't know it was <laughs> i don't remember when we were talking about that but yeah it i mean oh my god oh it was was it when you were talking about your 10 year old self sitting in the same room that was another time oh. that i i've cried like the past three episodes. <laughs> Not full blown, but I've teared up like the past three episodes about this movie. I can't wait to share it with you guys and not be like the only like crying on my own. I'm excited for the day where we all sit it's down and watch together. it. Oh my god. I cried when I watched your short film and I had nothing to do with that. Like when y'all first got the you got the final edit. I was with you guys because we were going oh, over the screen. Yeah, when you yeah. wrapped or when you got the final edit for Thanks for Coming. And I like was emotional. I had nothing to do with that short film. So. Oh my gosh. All steps of thanks for coming uh, when it was put in it, like when it's tangible and you're there on set and you get, have the stuff, it's just, oh yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. And this will be. Oh gosh. Know, we won't shut up. 10 times, 10 times the emotion. Cause it's a feature film and like the amount of time will be so much longer and all the work we've done before this film to grow and oh yeah the creation like the origin and Cheyenne you brought this up last episode because that's when we talked about making our feature film the origin of this story is a piece of all of our stories and how we became filmmakers and um oh that just that makes me emotional it's cathartic it's for sure. completely cathartic yeah Oh, I want to touch back on something that you asked earlier. I think I have a better answer for it now. When you were asking about what, like, what's good advice. I learned when I was writing the film that Quentin Tarantino was a somewhat unsuccessful actor, but he still would continue taking acting classes while writing and directing and even, you know, really, really using his acting knowledge to write his scripts because I, I read a lot of Quentin Tarantino scripts when I was learning how to write a film because I'd never written anything in script form before writing against us and you know his dialogue is super straightforward but the way that he writes scenes and action and the the inner thoughts of the characters within the script he adds a crazy amount of detail within his scripts yeah. but um, that's something that I was trying to learn how to do. So I was watching like master classes on acting when I was writing the script. And because I, I also had an, I saw online someone giving advice saying, don't teach the actors how to act when you're writing the characters. So I was trying to write, you know, be quantitative about things that are, kind of elusive like emotion and um you know the innermost thoughts you know i've i have no acting experience and that's something that i was trying to picture myself as an actor when i was writing the characters and you know and picturing cheyenne when writing the protagonist and just you know as i picture cheyenne as a full-fledged human being if she was in the situation how would she react what would her what would her emotion be? Because you know the protagonist and her disposition is quite different from how I see myself. So I wasn't really was trying to like separate how I would react to something or how I would approach something. And I tried to frame it more towards Cheyenne, believe it or not. So yeah, you're my muse, Cheyenne. I guess my muse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's interesting though because. Uh... As an actor who reads a lot of scripts, all of us do tons of audition sides. What you just described is like the definition of good writing. Like when we go into something, we immediately know if it's good writing or bad writing because of stuff like that. And you never want to give line reads, but you want to give the actor enough to where they understand that emotional and intellectual being of the character and if you don't do that the actor has to make it up so you're yeah. kind of doing yourself a disservice if you don't dive into that and figure out ways to sneak it in yeah and actors are taught 
as soon as you get a script to not look at the stage directions, like not like if it says to cry or if it says to laugh, they're not going to do that. They're going to follow the heart of the scene. So for you knowing that and then choosing to, you know, to not do that is I think really good. The words and the what's going on in the scene is what drives the emotion. Yep. Not saying cry, cry here. A single tear falls down her cheek. She laughs. Yeah, no. Right. So to wrap up this episode, we want to ask our two lovely writers what their top two to three favorite movies are. Whoever wants to go first. I mentioned some of mine earlier, but yeah, like Midsummer, Gone Girl. And I also mentioned Quentin Tarantino. So Kill Bill, Volume 2. Those are my favorite movies for sure. It's always hard because I could list like 15, but I'll stick with three. A Clockwork Orange, The Void, and yeah. Inglorious Bastards. I'll go with those three. More Quentin Tarantino. More Quentin Tarantino. I knew The Clockwork Orange was coming. I was waiting. I was <laughs> Kubrick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, have a, I like Eyes Wide Shut. That's my favorite Kubrick movie. I haven't seen that. I've heard it's very good, though. So good. Yeah, I've heard so it. good. It's his last film. I know, because Nicole Kidman and... Uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, yeah. AI was supposed to be his last film, but he died. Oh. And then Spielberg took it over. Ooh. Thank you for listening to our first guest interview podcast episode. If they want it, we'll have their information in the description and the show notes. And Emily, where can they find us on social media? You can find us at the Hags Podcast on Instagram and TikTok and Hag Productions on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And Jimmy, where can they watch or listen? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Be on Apple Podcast. Me and Apple are at war. But we're going to be on there at the Hag Podcast. And Hag. you can go to <laughs> the Hag's Podcast. Spotify is the Hag Podcast. YouTube is the Hag Productions. It'll all be linked down below. Please subscribe, like, comment, tell your friends, and we appreciate you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, Lord. Oh.